यस वेलकम वेलकम फ्रेंड्स फोन करो टुडे दिस इज द फोर्थ वर्चुअल सीएमई ऑफ द कॉलेज ऑफ जनरल प्रैक्टिशनर आई एम ए जीएसबी एंड टुडे वी आर टॉकिंग अबाउट कॉमन इमरजेंसीज एट द फैमिली फैमिली प्रैक्टिस लेवल आई रिक्वेस्ट डॉक्टर जसवंत दरबार सर टू इंट्रोड्यूस अबाउट आई एम ए सीजीपी एक्टिविटी and then we will further progress the cme dr jaswan darbar sir please respected dr madhav bhai uh, respected dr anish bhai dr kothari sir and dear friends uh, this is our fourth uh, webinar uh, from the college of gp im and gsb and uh, we have all we since beginning we have applied for this uh, gmc credit hours and uh, we are fortunate enough to get uh, this gmc credit hour from this fourth uh, webinar so who so ever will uh, attend two cme one hour two cme every month on third or second thursday of uh, thursday of month will be uh, having a cme from 4 to 5 pm and who so ever will attend uh, two minimum cme will get one credit hour and for that you have to register through google form every time will be we sending your google form and that you have to uh, apply for it and after uh, during lecture just you uh, mention your name in youtube and after lecture just uh, whatever say goodbye or welcome uh, thanks that that is the two message you have to drop in youtube so directly to uh, pragnesh for the introduction of the speaker thank you thank you jaswant darbar sir uh, we all know the gujarat is uh, known very well known dr anish chandarana a very senior interventional cardiologist basically is known as a goldy cardiologist uh, as he is a brilliant academic record with many gold medals at graduate post graduate and doctorate level has a keen keen entry, interest in clinical cardiology non invasive cardiology and international cardiology and has been pioneer in establishing pami program uh, at the, at their level For, he is the former assistant professor at the institute of cardiology and research center civil hospital ahmedabad he is a renowned teaching faculty with high academic interest and has delivered more than 700 lectures to train the medical students and practicing uh, doctors across the state and country has participated in many research projects which has been instrumental in innovation of some very important medicine and instrument instruments he especially believing in preventing heart disease through the healthy lifestyle and he himself is a very good uh, heart trainer and marathon runner so and he has been a student of vipassana so it's now time for you dr anish chandarana sir please dr anish chandarana sir yeah thank you dr pragnesh sir uh, respected teacher dr mahadev bhai my friend dr darbar my colleague dr jay kothari and all the office bearers of i am at the beginning i would not only thank you for getting me to this platform but also will extend my sincere compliments to you for conducting such a nice educative program for all the family physicians which is which is a really a need in today's era so coming to my topic which is cardiac emergencies which are faced by a family physician how would you recognize a particular cardiac emergency what will be the emergency care and how will you guide the patient further i'm sure most of you guys who are family physicians you practice in your clinic where you got either your office alone or maybe some of you might have got one or two or three beds for which you can treat the patient for some time and then subsequently if patient is more demanding care then patient may be shifted so i'll i'll narrate my different clinical scenarios as per your overall practice pattern now it's very important that a patient doesn't come explaining that i have got a cardiac emergency it is the symptoms various signs by which a patient presents so my job will be to divert your attention to which symptoms you should be considering for what diagnosis so let me give you some probable clinical scenarios as far as cardiac emergencies are concerned so number 1 a patient may come to you with potentially serious symptoms say for example a patient may come to you with acute chest pain patient might have chest pain heaviness ghabraman etc in today's world which is very very important that anybody who is presenting with any symptom 
starting from chin to umbilicus, whether it is on the front of the chest, whether it is on the back of the chest, or it is in the arms. Any such symptoms is now regarded as potentially acute cardiac problem. I don't say that every patient who present with any kind of symptoms will have heart issues, but you should be understanding that every symptom which happens between chin to umbilicus, either on the front or on the back or on the arms, can have cardiac issue. And that's why you should not neglect them. You have to chase them. Second complaint with which patient presents to you is acute breathlessness. A patient would say that previously I was fine, but now for last few days, I'm having breathlessness, which is maybe increasing. Or sometimes patient may be genuinely breathless, even he or she when comes to you in front of you in your office. Third symptom is patient may present to you with just palpitation. Fourth, a patient might give a short history of SINCA. A patient says that he or she had a sudden fall, which they could not understand because of what? And then patient regains consciousness within some seconds or some minutes. So that is called as transient loss of consciousness. That can be also a cardiac emergency. Or sometimes patient can have undue, unexplained perspiration. Most of the patients who have some kind of cardiac issue when they're present in emergency, they would have one, two, three, or four out of all these symptoms. Now, sometimes a patient may present to you with very slight symptoms or even no symptoms, but they have some test with you. Say, for example, a patient who had a day or two before had some kind of epigastric burning, went to some other doctor because you were not available. The doctor gave them antacids. Patient was fine. Doctor asked them to get a cardiogram done. Patient got the cardiogram on next day and has now come to you, said, sir, I don't have any complaint, but this is the cardiogram which was there before one day when I had epigastric pain. And if you look at that cardiogram, that cardiogram might have some serious signs in terms of, say, for example, ST elevation. So sometimes a patient may present to you who do not have symptoms or who do not have significant serious symptoms, but they have got some test with them which narrates some kind of seriousness. Say, for example, a patient may come to you with a blood pressure of 180 by 100. Patient says, I have zero symptoms, I am fine, but BP is 180 by 100. That is also a sort of cardiac emergency where you need to do some steps. Or as I talk to you, a patient may come to you with ECG with different changes. Some of you may be conversant with ECG, some of you may not be, but there are certain things in ECG which are quite obvious. Say, for example, ST elevation from V1 to V6. I'm very sure most of the family physicians would be able to understand that this is acute anterior myocardial infarction. Or a patient may come to you with a heart rate of 250, fast heart rate, where you might be able to conclude that this patient has got supraventricular tachycardia. Or in today's world, patient may come to you with some kind of blood test. Say, for example, again in the same scenario, patient had before two days some kind of epigastric pain. Patient went to doctor, took antacids, was fine. Doctor asked him to get a test called troponin. And that test was done next day. And now patient has come to you. Doctor, I had some such symptoms. Now my troponin report is this. So that troponin may be quite high. So that is also a cardiac emergency. So you as a family physician have to understand it very well that an emergency can be there in front of acute serious symptom or it can be there in terms of no serious symptoms or symptoms were in past but now there are some tests or findings which are quite serious and you have to take fast steps. So let's go to the first point, and that is acute chest pain. As you see in the slide, a patient who has any kind of symptoms, maybe chest pain, maybe heaviness, maybe gabramon, maybe burning, typical pain used to be in the center of the chest behind the sternum, used to radiate to the inner border of arm up to the little finger. But in today's world, this is very typical pain, but there are so many atypical presentations. Pain can be there on the right side of the chest. Pain can be there on the jaw. Pain can be there in the epigastric area. Pain can be there on the back near the scapula. All such symptoms should not be neglected. They should be evaluated thinking, is there a chance that this patient can have acute coronary syndrome? You will be helped by so many other features to define whether this pain is because of heart and coronary insufficiency or because of some other reasons, say, for example, gastric or musculoskeletal. So you need to understand what are the accompanying symptoms. 
a patient who has got epigastric distress, but also complaining, say, for example, I have got perspiration, I have got palpitation, that's where this epigastric pain is more likely to be cardiac. A patient who has got back pain who says that on exertion, my back pain worsens. When I go for toilet, when I go for bathroom and wash, my back pain increases. When I come out, my back pain goes off. So accompanying symptoms and situations will help you to understand whether such atypical symptoms are because of heart or not. A very, very important point in today's world is look at all the symptoms on the background of risk factors for cardiac disease. Let me explain you better. Somebody has got pain on the back of the chest and epigastric area. Now, if that person is a 13-year-old boy who doesn't have diabetes, blood pressure, any cardiac issue, has come to you for the first time, then it is very less likely that a patient has got cardiac issue. On the other side, the same pain, patient has got back pain near scapula, patient has got epigastric pain, but that patient is diabetic for last 15 years, has been a smoker for last 20 years, and has history of high blood pressure. Now, in this gentleman, this pain is very likely to be because of heart. So it's very, very important. You need to assess the symptoms of patient on the background of the risk factors for heart disease. In today's world, no symptom or sign can be checked without understanding the background of the patient. Whom these symptoms belong to is very, very important. Many times people come to me with a cardiogram, sir, this is a cardiogram, what is wrong? Cardiogram may look like it is inferior lobe myocardial infarction. I ask them, which patient is this? And they said, this is a boy, seven years old, and somebody has said he has a hole in heart. So entire story differs. So it's very, very important. More the risk factors a person has for coronary artery disease, more the chance that all these symptoms can be because of coronary insufficiency. So once you check for the symptoms, check for the signs, have evaluated patient's pulse, blood pressure, CVS, respiratory system, then you decide what is the probability that this pain is because of acute coronary insufficiency. There can be three probabilities, low probability, intermediate probability, and high probability. Let me give an example. If the pain is this, as I discussed to you, somebody who's 16 years, no risk factors, it's a low probability that this is because of acute coronary insufficiency. But as I talk to you, somebody who has got diabetes, smoking history, blood pressure, and somebody who's 65 years of age, he comes with these symptoms, he is a high probability that he could have acute coronary insufficiency. So symptoms, accompanying symptoms, signs, and patient's risk factor profile, based on this, you are going to take further steps. Now, if you've got a facility of ECG and blood test with you, you can send ECG and high sensitivity troponin for at least those patients whom you consider moderate or high probability of acute coronary insufficiency. And then you start some treatment. What is the treatment? That patient has to rest in front of you on a, on a bed. If patient's oxygen saturation is less, you can start oxygen. Isosorbide dinitrate, that is sorbitol or isodyl 5 milligram to be given sublingually, is one area which is to be addressed with little caution. There are patients who can have acute myocardial infarction, say for example, inferior myocardial infarction or anterior myocardial infarction with shock. Now, their blood pressure will be low. In such situations, when you give sublingual sorbitrate, it will further reduce the blood pressure. So in your clinic, anybody who comes to you with such symptoms where you think it is cardiac, you give sorbitrate sublingually 5 milligram only if BP is satisfactorily good. Giving disprin 350 milligram dissolved is absolutely safe in all the patients unless those rare cases where you believe it is acute peptic perforation. Otherwise, disprin is safe. Statin is the safest drug. So in all such patients where you think there is a moderate to high probability of acute coronary insufficiency, give them 80 milligram atorvastatin or 40 milligram rosuvastatin. And those patients whose blood pressure is more than 110 and there is tachycardia, you can give a small dose of beta blocker. So without ECG and blood test, any patient who comes to you with such symptoms where you think patient has moderate to high probability of acute coronary insufficiency, these are the treatments you should be giving in your clinic or if you have been called by a patient at their home, these are the treatment, and then you take ECG and HS troponin. Second such symptom is acute dyspnea. Again, you look into the history of dyspnea, whether it happens at rest or exertion, 
whether a patient has a history of PND, paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, where typically a patient will go to bed, will lie down, and maybe after one to three hours, patient will be waking up with severe breathlessness and patient will be fighting for the air. So this is very important history. Again, look for the risk factors for heart failure. Risk factors for heart failure are roughly same as they are for ischemic heart disease. So anybody who has got diabetes, hypertension, past history of ischemic heart disease, angioplasty, bypass, past history of heart attack, all these are the patients who have chance to have left ventricular dysfunction or heart failure very easily. So again, define the probability that what is the probability this patient's breathlessness is heart versus lung. So if you believe that patient has got past history of myocardial infarction, patient has a history of angioplasty bypass, there is very high chance that this breathlessness is because of heart failure. Obviously, you are going to look at heart rate, blood pressure, saturation, crepitations on lungs, etc. Et so they will all help you to define. But as you know, and also I know that there are a few patients where it becomes very, very difficult to differentiate whether this breathlessness is because of lungs or heart or because of some other issues. Out of 10 such cases with the adequate history and clinical examinations, at least in five, you will be able to conclude that this is more likely to be heart. So obviously you need a battery of investigations. But before that, again, what you have to do in emergency is rest, oxygen inhalation, if patient saturation is less, if blood pressure is good, you can give sorbitate sublingual. A very important point for most of such patients, giving a shot of diuretic, either IV or oral, is not going to be harmful. If patient's blood pressure is good, you can always give a small dose of diuretic. A very important medicine at this stage is if patient is tachycardic. It may be heart failure and tachycardia. It may be respiratory issue and tachycardia. But if pulse is more than 100, Evabradine is one safe drug which will help the reduction in heart rate. So if it is hard, patient will be benefited. If it is not hard, patient may not get disadvantaged, but at least there may be some benefit. And if this patient has got hypertension, if blood pressure is more, you can give him blood pressure reducing medicines. RAS blockade is a preferred drug, but only one issue is you are if you are not aware about renal function. And if you believe this patient can have acute kidney injury, you may not give RAS blockade and can give some hemlodipine like drug. So these are the medications which you have to give to any patient who comes to you with breathlessness, where you believe the probability of acute LVF is at least moderate or high. These are the drugs which are going to work. Evabredin is a drug which reduces heart rate without reducing blood pressure, but it is effective only if patient has got sinus tachycardia. If a patient has got SVT or atrial fibrillation, it doesn't work. So if you believe, based on your palpitation of pulse, that pulse is very regular, then you can give evabredin even before doing ECG. Third symptom with which patient can present to you is acute palpitation. Now, when patient comes with palpitation, you ask the history whether it is episodic or patient has been feeling this palpitation for long. You, sometimes a patient who is adequately intelligent can also help you whether palpitation is very fast at a rate of 150, 200. Sometimes patient might have measured the pulse. Sometimes patient might have measured with the oxygen saturation probe and can have some idea about the pulse. You can ask whether it is regular or irregular. You can ask about accompanying symptoms. A very, very important point as far as approach to treatment is concerned in patient with palpitation is symptoms. Almost any arrhythmia, whether take your body, which is not giving any symptoms of giddiness, dizziness, low feeling, chest pain or breathlessness, may not need emergency treatment. Let me repeat. Any arrhythmia, whether bradycardia or tachycardia, if patient has no symptoms, they may not need emergency treatment. So that's why don't jump to the treatment without understanding the symptoms. Say, for example, you might have a patient who has come to you with history of occasional palpitation. He says, at the moment, I don't have an issue. If you examine the pulse, which is 35 per minute, please don't get panic. Don't worry. Patient is fine, has no giddiness, no chest pain, no breathlessness. You have time to understand what it is. On the other side, patient has a heart rate of 140. Again, no giddiness, no dizziness, no chest pain, no breathlessness. Again, you have time to evaluate. So it's very, very important. So obviously, you are going to look at the patient clinically. You are going to check patient's CVS respiratory system. And then what is the treatment? 
If a patient has got symptoms, the first thing is ask the patient to lie down if patient can. Because when patient has any kind of tachycardia or bradycardia, his or her stroke volume or cardiac output is less. The first brain, first part which is going to go with reduced perfusion is brain. So that's why if patient has no acute breathlessness and patient can lie down, ask the patient to lie down with any kind of arrhythmia. Check oxygen, give oxygen if required. And if patient's blood pressure is good, in any arrhythmia, you can give isosorbide dinitrate 5 milligram, which is fine, which will make patient feel that some treatment has started. And secondly, it also reduces LV and diastolic pressure. So will help the perfusion of coronary. Now, very important point. If you believe there is drop beat, that is only VPC and APC, you perhaps do not need any kind of treatment. While if you have ECG facility, or even if no ECG, but if you can understand that patient's heart rate is more than 130, where patient might have SVT, patient might have atrial fibrillation, you can give some rate reducing drugs. Say, for example, beta blocker, injectable. So metoprolol 5 milligram diluted in 10, milliga, 10 ml of saline can give slowly with pulse and blood pressure check. Or you can give diltiazem. A very important point is when you want to give beta blocker and diltiazem injectable, you have to have two, three issues cleared. Patient should not be in heart failure and patient should not have hypotension. So these drugs to be given to a patient who has got fast palpitation, pulse rate more than 130, only if there are no crepitations, no dyspnea, and blood pressure is more than 110. Otherwise, sometimes you can worsen the situation before patient reaches hospital. If patient has a bradycardia less than 40 without symptoms, don't worry. There is no need to give atropine. If patient has pulse less than 40 with symptoms of dizziness, giddiness, yes, you can give atropine before you take the patient for further checkup. Syncup. Syncup is one symptom. Syncup is not a disease. What is syncup? Sudden loss of consciousness, which might lead to fall. Generally, it is transient, self-limiting, and patient gains consciousness within seconds to minutes. So this is very important. Patient becomes aware and conscious without any therapeutic intervention. So that means patient had something wrong for a short time, which was self-limiting and got corrected spontaneously. So this is called a syncup. Now syncup, basically there are two areas which you need to define, whether it is vasovagal syncup or syncup has got some serious cause. Now, as you know that, there can be various serious causes. Say, for example, patient might have a short episode of ventricular tachycardia leading to hypotension. Then ventricular tachycardia got abruptly terminated and patient came to sinus rhythm. Patient wakes up. Similarly, a short episode of bradycardia. Patient has complete heart block or sick sinus syndrome. Suddenly the rate was 25. Patient collapsed. <laughs> now heart rate has come up. Or sometimes patient can have neurological illness. A very important point is going into little detailed history. If patient has risk factors, blood pressure, diabetes, past history of IHD, angioplasty, bypass, heart failure, or patient has past history of neurological illness, there is more chance that you are dealing with some serious cause. A person who is relatively young, aging anything between 5-10 years to 30-35 years without risk factors, and if history is suggestive of some sudden strain, stress, or pain, it can be vasovagal. So it's very, very important to try to evaluate. Generally, such patients, if you believe has got something other than vasovagal, they need thorough evaluation. Even a patient who has likely vasovagal needs a thorough evaluation to check it. A very important point I would like to share with you, textbook of cardiovascular medicine by Brownwell says, 50% of people on this earth will experience at least one vasovagal syncope in his or her life. So out of, say, for example, we are 700 crore at the moment on this earth, 350 crore would experience at least one syncope vasovagal in their life. So this is a very important point. Coming to sort of last two slides, then we'll sum up and then we'll open the session for discussion. A patient may come to you without symptoms, but just high blood pressure. This is a very common scenario. Blood pressure is 180 by 100, 180 by 80, isolated systolic hypertension. And then you are tempted to treat them in emergency. Now, very important point is you need to ask them, do you have any symptom? Any blood pressure value which doesn't have symptoms, 
no chest pain, no breathlessness, no CNS symptoms, absolutely fine, neat and clean. They do not need envision. They do not need any emergency medicine. What you have to do is you have to optimize the treatment. You have to upscale the treatment. You have to make the treatment legitimate. What do I mean? Say, for example, A, B, C, D. Young people less than 40, 45, 50 years of age, they respond better to angiotensin receptor blockers or ACE inhibitors and beta blockers. While senior citizens, they respond to CD, that is C is calcium channel blocker, D is diuretic. So many times we do see that a patient is not receiving proper treatment. I might get a senior citizen of 67 years age whose blood pressure is 180 by 100. If I look to that gentleman, he is on metoprolol sustained release 50 milligram. So that's where treatment is not legitimate. He should be at least on C and D, that is CCB and diuretic. So optimize the treatment, upscale the dose or make the legitimate treatment. And also if needed, look for the secondary cause. Somebody coming to you with a BP of 180, 170, there is a high chance that he or she will have got some secondary cause. So either you evaluate or send the patient for evaluation. You need to take emergency treatment steps only if patient has got symptoms of acute target organ damage. So somebody coming to you with a BP of 180 with chest pain, with dyspnea, with some symptoms of suggestive of TIA, or if you palpate the pulse on lower limb, anybody who comes to you with a BP of more than 160, 170, look at the dorsalis pedis and posterior tibial. If you find absent pulse, these are the patients who need admission and emergency treatment. What is the treatment for such patients who come to you with high blood pressure and acute symptoms? Rest, better in recumbent position, oxygen if needed, you can give isosorbide dinitrate sublingual. It will help to reduce blood pressure also. You can repeat the dose. There is no role of sublingual nifedipine, which is out because it can lead to precipitous fall in blood pressure and it can harm some patients. Whom it can harm? It can harm anybody or at least those people who have got acute ischemic stroke. You know that in patient who has got acute ischemic stroke, a desired blood pressure is 180 by 95 or 100. So in such patients, if you drastically reduce blood pressure, they will worsen. Their infarct size will increase. They may go comatose. So be careful to rule out stroke in all patients who come to you with a high BP. If there is no stroke evidence, you can give or oral amlodipine or if tachycardia beta blocker. Those patients who have got BP of more than 180, 190, no evidence of stroke, you want to reduce blood pressure. Only two injectable drugs are better used. One is IV enalapril and second is IV beta blocker. There are two kinds of IV or three kinds of IV beta blocker available. Previously, Ismolol was easily available. Now it's difficult. You can use metoprolol or you can use labetalol. Both of them are available. But again, as I talk to you, be careful to rule out for stroke and don't lead to precipitous reduction in blood pressure. And all these patients do need further care. So coming to last slide, sometimes a patient may come to you without symptoms or slight symptoms or they had symptoms before two days, which were a little acute. They were taken care of by some treatment and now they have got some kind of test with them. Say, for example, a patient has got this ECG, which is suggestive of acute inferior myopathy infarction. So when you see such ECGs and if you read it well, that yes, patient has got multiple contagious lead ST elevation, patient had some history suggestive of chest pain or epigastric pain or something. So all these patients or patient has got deep T inverse, well and sign. There is non-QMI in your term when most of you were students. So these are the patients who should be given at least this treatment as early as possible. Disprin 350 milligram. Ticagrerol is the best antiplatelet agent to be given in today's world. 90 milligram, two tablets straight. 80 milligram atorvastatin, and you can even give low molecular heparin subcutaneously. So this is very important. I personally believe in today's world in 21st century, all the family physicians should make them conversion to understand at least ST elevation MI or something which was previously called as non-QMI. These two ECGs you need to learn because in this patient's time is money, time is hard. You have to treat them as early as possible. Another scenario, a patient may come to you with some vague history, some epigastric pain, some back pain, some chest pain before one to two days, has got now some atypical ECG changes, mild STT changes. But as I talk to you, if you believe that patient has got multiple risk factors. Somebody comes to with mild STT changes, some epigastric pain before two days, but that gentleman is diabetic, smoker, hypertensive. He's a high-risk gentleman. Again, treat him or her with the same treatment. 
Sometimes a patient may come to you with some test like troponin. If you see troponin and if it is more than three times of upper limit of normal, say for example, troponin normal range in the laboratory you get it done is 14, 14. If patient has got the value of more than 42, treat them like acute MI. Sometimes troponin value of that high may be because of some other reason. That's fine. But out of 10 such patients, eight or nine would have recent acute MI. And that's where if they have not received any treatment, giving them this treatment is very, very useful. So ladies and gentlemen, I think within 20 minutes, I try to give you some idea about how to tackle with acute symptoms or some acute signs or some tests. And now for next 10 minutes, if the moderators allow, I can be open to, to answer your questions. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a wonderful talk, Dr. Anish Chandarana. We will keep the question answer session at the last after Dr. Jai Katwari's talk. Uh, Pregnant, uh, uh, if Anish, is it convenient to you, Nadeb, after 20 minutes of Jai Kothari, because there are four or five questions in line. Okay, so what what we we can? Anish, no, no, I, I want to ask Anish Bhai. Yes. Ah, see, uh, if if it is convenient to you after the uh, questions after uh, Jay Kothari's uh, like twenty minute I'm, lecture. I am okay. I am okay. Let let us finish with the topic of Jay, so because, that uh, we do not lose. Because time. there are four or five questions for you also, so please uh, sure. be online. Uh, we'll uh, discuss question after Kothari's sub lecture. Okay. Okay. Let's go. I agree. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, now we have uh, the next lecture on the non cardiac emergency. And for that, we have a critical care specialist, Dr. Jai Kothari. Dr. Jai Kothari is a true, acad true academician. As uh, you can understand, that he, he is at present in France and he is joining us from the France for this uh, learning session. Dr. Jai Kothari is a director and consultant critical care department, Apollo Hospital, Ahmedabad. He is an advisor, critical care department, uh, BAPS, STAR, SMBS Hospital. He is a director, Spectrum Medical Education. He is a director of Spectrum Critical Care and Pulmonary Associated. And he is a teacher for DNB critical care students. So it's now uh, over to you, Dr. Jay Kothari, sir. Dr. Jay Kothari, please. Oh, he is not there. I think he is at the France in the periphery. So in between, uh, once he joined, can we take the question answer, Darbar sir, with Dr. Anil Sindarana? Uh, Dr. Othari, do you hear us? I think some issue with the... Uh, meanwhile, we can take... The, uh, Question we can take answers, yes. Yeah, and and I will try to uh, call Dr. Kothari. Yeah. See, uh, first question uh, to Anish Bhai. See, uh, I saw the first slide. Initially, your first slide was uh, stating this any patient having acute MI, dyspraine, uh, aterostatin, and four tablet uh, this clopid agrol. And uh, in this slide, I missed this clopid agrol. So, what is the point? Uh, you, you mentioned take agrol. So, do you uh, will you highlight something uh, by uh, clopidogrel uh, instead of uh, clopidogrel ticagrelor? Uh, hello, hello. has gone somewhere. Huh? Dr. Madhav, sir, can... Madhav, you can answer the same question. Same question, yeah. Uh -huh. You are mute, Madhav, sir. Uh, these days, ticagrelor becomes the number one drug of choice because it has got a reversible effect on the platelet. So if 
the patient has to be taken for PAMI, uh, we would not expect any bleeding complications during the procedures. Clopidogrel has a very long half-life. So given choice, if available, we should go for ticagrel. Or if it is not available, and most of the time we used to keep only clopidogrel with us. So in that case, uh, clopidogrel would be the drug of choice. But if both are available, I use ticagrel or because of its short uh, half-life and immediate effect. Effect is also faster and uh, reversible. Okay. Uh, yes. Dr. Jay Kothari is there. Uh, I already introduced sir you. Uh, Dr. Jay Kothari sir is a critical care specialist at the Apollo Hospital. Sir, I already introduced uh, you. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, you can directly start your talk, sir. Please. Is this slide seen? Ah, uh, yes, visible, sir. Yeah, yeah, visible. Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, I'm sorry for the little glitch. A uh, great lecture by Dr. Anishbhai. He has taught us a few topics when we were young. Uh, good afternoon, Dr. Madhavbhai. Without wasting much of time, uh, I had the responsibility to talk about non-cardiac emergency, which is which is a huge, huge, huge topic. A patient can present with plethora of symptoms and plethora of diagnosis in such manner. I would uh, try to make few topics highlighted for the family physicians and in, in, in their clinical practice. So let us start with the neurological issues. A patient can present to you with acute altered mental status or, or uh, altered sensorium. And one needs to understand what are the possible differential diagnosis for such kind of situation. Anybody who is confused, irritable, who is obtuned, who is depressed, who is unconscious, would have one of these causes. Neurological causes where the brain directly is involved, trauma, tumors, ischemic stroke, hemorrhagic stroke, subarachnoid hemorrhage, brain infection, seizure, acute hydrocephalus, hypertensive crisis, and there are a lot more diagnoses which can directly involve brain and patient can present with a spectrum of neurological issues. Similarly, metabolic causes, either low oxygen, high carbon dioxide, low sugar, high sugar, hypo or hypernatremia or hypo or hypercalcemia. Infection in the elderly person can present as obtuned mental status. Be careful about this. This patient have actually infection which is causing their brain dysfunction, uremic encephalopathy, hepatic encephalopathy. Wernicke's encephalopathy, and so and so forth. There are a lot of metabolic causes which can affect the sensorium of a person. A person can have medication overdose, or a person can have narco poisoning, or he is a drug abuser, alcohol or cocaine like drugs, which can alter the sensorium. And a serious uh, increase in temperature or decrease in temperature also causes altered mental system. So, for one symptoms, you probably have to look at too many things uh, in the non-cardiac emergency and how to go about such kind of situation. <laughs> Each patient should receive primary general supportive care irrespective of the diagnosis if they have altered mental status and it should start with A, B, C, D. Most of the emergency management, whatever is the diagnosis, this is the uh, sequence that everybody needs to follow. We need to check the patency of airway, breathing, circulation, disability, and we'll have to completely expose the patient to understand what all are the problems with the patient. For patients who are having acute altered mental stress, they should be positioned appropriately so that the airway can be maintained. Uh, left lateral position uh, so that the vomiting does not be uh, does not get aspirated. We have to prevent the tongue bite also. We'll have to do the blood sugar check, monitor the heart rate, blood pressure, respiratory rate, <clears throat> breathing pattern and temperature, and take a detailed history. So with one symptoms, you'll have to do a lot of things simultaneously, one by one, and try to understand what is the kind of diagnosis this patient might be. And you'll have to provide general supportive care to such patient. If the blood sugar is low, provide the sugar either oral or IV. And then comes the detailed neurological examination, which you need to do at your level. 
and level of consciousness needs to be assessed. Patient's eye opening, verbal response, motor response, and respiratory pattern should be examined. GCS score, Glasgow Coma Scale score, AVPU scale, or four score can be used to understand what is the level of consciousness and how serious the patient is. Patient's brainstem reflexes needs to be evaluated. Patient, whether patient has hemiplegia, paraplegia, quadruplegia, or hemiparesis, paraparesis, quadruparesis. Uh, what is the uh, motor response of patient to the pain? What is the tone? What is the reflex? And what is the breathing pattern? This would make you understand what is the seriousness of the patient and whether patient does have a structural brain disease or a functional brain disease. Structural brain disease where the brain is directly involved due to tumor, trauma, stroke or any such kind of things. And functional brain disease is metabolic encephalopathy, toxic encephalopathy or systemic disease which is going to cause the altered sensory. And once you understand that, you'll have to do the appropriate imaging of the brain, whether you want to do CT scan plane, contrast, MRI plane or contrast, MR venography to understand the uh, cerebral venous sinus thrombosis. You need to do basic blood workup or you'll have to send such patient to the emergency hospital management uh, and ICU admission to uh, get it evaluated further. So this is the most important thing where a general practitioner or a family physician, a patient presents to you with uh, the symptoms of small facial dropping or uh, arm drift or some kind of speech difficulty, which has resolved, which is resolving, which is developing, which is already developed. And you need to understand what is the time of onset of such symptom because therapeutic window for, for stroke thrombolysis is 4.5 hours uh, IV and for 24 hours for mechanical thrombectomy. A stroke can, ischemic stroke can present with loss of vision, confusion, incontinence, parasthesia and so on and so forth. So you need to keep checking about this fast if the patient is, a, a patient approaches you with some kind of altered mentation. For the blood pressure targets, that's a usual old day practice that if the blood pressure is high, give sublingual dapin, which is going to be very, very detrimental in patients with neurological disease. Please do not give such kind of sublingual dapin. Even the, the targeted blood pressure control for ischemic stroke, where the blood pressure needs to be a little on the higher side, should be approached. If the patient is receiving the thrombolysis, then only the blood pressure needs to be reduced acutely with the drugs. For hypertensive intracranial blood pressure, systolic blood pressure should be reduced for patients with subarachnoid. All these patients are anyway going to get admitted if they are serious and sick enough, and the hospital administration will take a hospital clinician would take a call uh, from then on. But you need to understand that this patient, the stroke patient, the patient with ischemic stroke, if they are presented within the window period, you should transfer them to a hospital where facility of IV thrombolysis and endovascular therapy for ischemic stroke is available. So please be aware about uh, trying to send them to an MRI center and send them to a neurologist and then they go to a hospital would probably lose, uh, lose the uh, loss the uh, important time and patient might have lifelong disability which could have been uh, prevented or saved or decreased uh, with the timely therapy of acute stroke. If your patient is having acute seizure or patient is having unconscious, please try to understand whether patient has generalized tonic-clonic seizure or patient has partial seizure which is focal tonic-clonic movement or patient is suddenly confused, there is no change in the posture and have stopped activity, patient look blank, this is absent seizure. Any patient whose single episode of convulsion, if it lasts for more than five minutes, it is catastrophic, such patient might be qualified for status epilepticus. If patients uh, have two or more convulsion, uh, without recovery of consciousness, then this is status epilepticus, which is a serious emergency 
send such patient to the emergency department directly. For a patient of acute seizure, please provide general supportive care, position the patient to prevent aspiration and tongue bite, put a mouth gag in the, uh, put a mouth gag so that patient does not create tongue bite. Establish an IV access, check the sugar, if there is hypoglycemia related seizure, treat it with glucose. If the patient is having seizure, and if you have the facility to give midazolam or benzodiazepine, please give that, nothing would happen. Uh, trying to give IV anticonvulsant uh, also is possible in your clinic. Uh, further treatment should be done at the hospital level for serious seizures. Many of the patients would come with poisoning, accidental poisoning, intentional poisoning, or patient has occupational exposure to hazardous chemical and compounds. And some of the patients and, uh, might do malignering, saying that I have consumed the poison, but actually they have not. Please try to learn this toxidromes, the bundle of symptoms, which is going to be there simultaneously in different uh, magnitude and severity, this would allow you and lead to lead you to a diagnosis of particular poisoning, like an anticholinergic uh, uh, toxidrome, patient had altered mental status, dry skin, mucus, dry skin and mucus membrane, patient would have fixed pupils, dilated pupils, patient would have tachycardia, hyperthermia, flushing, and urine retention. So such toxidromes can help you diagnose the which kind of poison patient has taken. For any initial management of poison, general supportive care, as I mentioned, A, B, C, D, E, should be done for patients with high, uh, low sugar. They should receive the sugar. If patients have bradycardia hypotension, treat it with appropriate measures like atropine <clears throat> and IV. Then comes the detailed survey of the organ systems or the uh, uh, other symptoms where what patient have, which would lead to a clue what patient have consumed. Try to identify the poison, the timing of the poison, and possibly the amount of poison. Many a times patient might not speak the truth, but as a family physician, you have multiple resources to reconfirm such kind of situation, uh, such kind of information. The most important thing is to prevent further absorption of any such uh, hazardous material. For specific poison, antidotes are available. For most of the drugs, supportive care and uh, uh, supportive care is required. And for serious poisoning patients, they should be uh, uh, they should be provided with a safe transfer, which is where they should not get collapse in between during the transfer, uh, please provide the safe transfer. Evaluate different systems to understand the toxidromes, neurology, respiratory, cardiovascular. If you have ECG and patient have various uh, ECG changes related to the drug consumption. And check the temperature, hyperthermia, hypothermia, both could be the sign and symptoms of the poison. Gastric lavage has had huge, huge uh, fan following. Every other family physician or at a local level, people try to do gastric lavage. It is not recommended routinely. It has never shown to demonstrate mortality reduction. If at all it has to be done, it has to be done within first hour of ingestion. After first hour, only 10% of poison can be removed with gastric lavage. Gastric lavage is, a delayed gastric lavage may be useful in opioid consumption, which is not very significantly uh, present in our side as of now. Serious side effects of gastric lavage has been documented multiple times, nasal trauma, bleeding. Risk of aspiration is one of the significant side effects. And then later on, patient would develop ARDS and respiratory failure and would die because of such kind of measures, uh, which would not beneficial to the patient. It is contraindicated in patient with depressed sensorium, acid and alkali ingestion, hydrocarbon or petroleum product ingestion, any volatile substance ingestion. And if you are doing gastric lavage, please do it properly. Do not aspirate. 
the column uh, the the you in, in infuse 200 ml of water normal water through rt and then they lower the tube below the stomach level so that the all fluid comes out do do not keep infusing more and more water if the water is not coming out from the right so you follow the proper protocols for such kind of thing activated charcoal also has gained a lot of popularity it is useful for few drugs which has got very high enterohepatic uh, circulation single dose activated charcoal and multi drug active uh, multi dose activated charcoal can be useful for carbamazepine dapsone phenobarbital theophylline digoxin kind of drugs the dose is 50 to 100 gram which is very high not two to four capsule if you want to give such kind of dose it requires a real real huge effort if this charcoal goes in the lung then the patient have very 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 serious and bad ARDS and probably patient will die because of the ARDS related to charcoal aspiration please do it very carefully if you are doing the most common poisoning that we are seeing in our part of the uh, world is organophosphorus patient would have symptoms of defecation urination meiosis bronchospasm emesis lacrimation and salivation you can simply look at dumbbells for uh, remembering it this patients might have uh, loss of airway control uh, then uh, you maintain the airway potency atropine is the immediate drug for patient having such symptoms and low heart rate 2 to 5 milligram bolus repeated as necessary and start infusion when you are transferring the patient be careful that the patient keep on receiving this atropine do not leave do not allow the patient to get transferred without a proper medical facility or ambulance palm is given which is the evidence for is a palm is significantly non-conclusive but if somebody wants to give 30 milligram per kg bolus over 30 to 60 minutes and then infusion is 8 milligram per kg per hour for several days this is very high in terms of the regular practice of one ampule eight hourly one ampule bd and one ampule four hourly please calculate the dose if you want to treat with palm that is what uh, i would recommend glycopyrrhoid can be used to reduce oral and tracheal secretion glycopyrrhoid does not cause blood brain barrier so the delirium which is associated with atropine can be reduced many patients of organophosphorus while they are recovering <clears throat> they still might have significant tracheal secretion or significant salivation this patient can be helped with the uh, glycopyrrhoid if the patient develops seizure it should be treated with benzodiazepine as a family physician you need to know the specific management also for very different set of uh, poisons so for self host till five years back there was no treatment and we used to read that 100 percent of self host patient would die since last few years as the ecmo is available ecmo is life-saving in self host and probably we have done about 28 self uh, ecmo on self host 27 have survived and gone home so Till few years back, our colleagues, if somebody has consumed cell phone, they would never give the option also. They would not transfer, uh, go to civil hospital, nothing would happen or uh, patient would die. This is not the case with cell phones anymore. It can be treated. Paracetamol poisoning is upcoming in India. If somebody consumes more than 10 grams of paracetamol, then it is quite serious. Patient would significantly be benefited and few of the side effects can be prevented with n acetylcysteine again the dose has to be remembered 200 milligram per kg or four hours it is not counted in ampules again it is counted in milligram per kg please uh, follow such kind of protocols and few of the poisons like methanol latakan this can be treated with aggressive use of hemodialysis and crrt so if such patients are there if they are sent to an appropriate setup and the patient receives the tree therapy and treatment the patient can be saved uh, advanced care in the poisoning management could help support the organ function 
and could save the life. You are presented with many times with dog bite, cat bite, rabbit bite, human bite, snake bite. There are a lot of bites which is possible and one needs to understand such bites are provoked versus unprovoked bite. Provoked bite are more stronger type of animal bite and its health and vaccination status if there is dog, time and location of event. If the if the wound is bleeding, then compress the wound. Do not suture the wound of any bites. That is the dictum unless they are on face. Primal closure of such kind of wound is not recommended. Only compression is recommended. Please follow guidelines for rabies vaccination and tetanus vaccination whenever such kind of animal bite happens. And many a time, prophylactic antibiotic is prescribed for such kind of patient. So patient who has category 2 exposure with minor scratches or abrasion uh, without much of bleeding, vaccination is enough with rabies. For category 3 kind of um, exposure with the dog whose vaccination status is not known, then immediate vaccination and rabies immunoglobulin also is required. Rabies immunoglobulin has to be infiltrated around the wound. 20 IU per kg is the dose, not easily available and costly, but life-saving because any rabies vaccination would take few days before the antibody develops in the body. So for stray dog whose vaccination status is not understood and if the, uh, if the uh, bite is deep, then uh, uh, the immunoglobulin would be required. For snake bite, make sure, reassure the patient, reassure to yourself that all snakes are not poisonous. The treatment is easy with anti-snake venom, 10 vials, up to 15, 50 vials can be given. Initially, there was significant risk of anaphylactic reaction. Nowadays, with dry powder, the risk of reaction anaphylaxis is very, very rare. There are a lot of myths about the snake bite management in the pre-hospital time. Such patients should be carried to the hospital. They should not be allowed walking. Please do not tie tourniquet. Do not do cold compress. Do not do ice packing. Do not soak the wound in the water. And no filmy scenario of sucking the venom from the wound. Don't apply anything on the wound. Don't try to kill the snake. Don't raise the sight of bite above the heart. Keep the sight or wound sight below the heart level most of the time. Reassure the patient. Immobilize the limb. Safe transfer to the hospital. Give ASV. Patient would survive. Not an issue. There are a lot of patients who come to you with some kind of injury, some kind of cuts, puncture wounds, lacerated wounds abrasion, what to do in such scenario, TT, tetanus toxoid injection or immunoglobulin if the history is not known. Clean wound can be sutured. Do not suture contaminated wound bites or puncture wound. Clean the contaminated wound with lot of sterile normal saline or water. Remove debris or contamination from the wound. This contaminated wound in future can become cellulitis, create a lot of other issues uh, uh, for a very long, long time. Control bleeding by direct pressure. Do not use tourniquet. Do not remove any penetrating substance attached to the body in unmonitored uh, way. So if something is gone inside and still inside, leave it there, allow it to be removed in the hospital setup with proper uh, facility around. Prescribe antibiotic in the contaminated wound. Otherwise, antibiotic is not required. Uh, there are a lot of other things which is there. With anaphylaxis, adrenaline is the choice of drug. Do not get worried about the tachydysmythia. Use adrenaline in the given dose. Use infused saline. Uh, for uh, management of hypotension. 
uh, acute febrile illness, patient with hypotension, understand the early warning sign of altered mentation, tachycardia, tachypnea, hypotension, decreased urine output. For dengue, so for patient with dengue, a severe hemoconcentration is impending multi-organ failure and do fluid resuscitation. Again, the dose is 20 to 30 milligram per kg is about 1500 ml of fluid, which is about three bottle. Give to the patient fast, do not worry. Uh, you may have, patient may present to you with heat stroke and heat related disease. The treatment is 1.5 to 2 liter of cold fluid, either orally or intravenously. Antipyretics are not usually effective. And if the heat related disease are not treated well, patient can develop multi organ failure, renal failure, severe coagulopathy, and can die. For burns management, Run cold water over scalded burns. If there is chemical burn, flash away with water for 20 minutes, not for 2-3 minutes. And alkaline compounds are much more dangerous than the acidic compound to create the burns. Remember that. Sometimes we have a false belief that the acids are more, more dangerous. But for body, alkaline substances are much more dangerous for the burns. For eye also, if you have chemical exposure to the eye, alkali is more dangerous and about 1 liter of 0.9 normal saline should be run through the eye with the IV tubing if there is a, a chemical exposure too high. Trauma is a separate subject uh, with the time limit. We cannot do it right now. Uh, <coughs> And with that, I would like to uh, end the session. Uh, thank you very much uh, uh, for allowing me to share some of the uh, non-cardiac emergency management. Uh, over to you, Dr. Zabar Saab and Dr. Madhubi. Thank you, uh, Dr. Kothari Saab. Uh, now we'll come, we are coming to the questions and answers. There is one question uh, from... Uh, Dr. Madhav Bhai, that before treating any this accidental poisoning, intentional or non-intentional, uh, should we inform police first or should we insist a uh, patient to uh, go for MLC or should we keep record of proper record and then after treating patient, we should uh, inform police? Uh, to give treatment is our prima facie responsibility. Uh, then at a given convenient time, police need police can be informed for the medical legal scenario. Uh, that it is not compulsory to inform police first, or it is not to be afraid or apprehend. We have to have any apprehension regarding police cases. The patient who has consumed, we have not done anything wrong, and if we don't inform the police uh, in time, so there are incidences where patient has taken the poison patient was taken to y clinic they treated the patient for one or two days they didn't inform the police in 48 hours now the patient goes to some other institute and that institute creates medical legal uh, that institute informs the police this creates a negative uh, remark on your side that's be careful about that dr darbar i am giving the answer as far as the emergency or dire emergency concerns, uh, nothing is required immediately, whether it may be consent or police inquiry. But we are supposed to inform the police. We are not supposed to wait for the police to come because the life is even more important rather than any legal procedure by the even court also. But we have to keep the total records of vital status and whatever there is a condition of the patient and how the patient came. But again, the ABCD, as uh, Dr. Jay Kotari said, it is a first priority for any emergency of the patient. But we have to inform the police and all the emergency cases, I think, whether it's traumatic or non-traumatic, particularly traumatic, all the police must, all the cases police must be informed for MLC. Then it will be the point of the relation, uh, I mean, the patient and the police, whether to go for case or not. But we are supposed to inform. Them. I can okay. add one thing. 
Dr. Dharma, yeah. I just asked the question for only reason of non-traumatic. Trauma is fine, but in yeah. non-traumatic, usually when it's a question of poisoning and that do females are involved, there can be argument and counter-argument from both the sides, in-laws and both sides. So that is why it's better that we have at least the record. I agree that yes. we have to we have read to first, but we have to keep if the we record, keep yeah. the record, we are in soup. And we have to give that list that we have to inform. And if they don't inform or they have to give in writing that, no, it's not something, whatever we, we have. But, to inform the patient. But, yeah. Yes, uh, I would object. Yeah. Uh, okay, the, the doctor Dhiren is at present studying JNL, JNLU course, which uh, Gujarat State Branch IMA has started with JNLU, JNLU about uh, medical legal, which is of one year. And I think uh, Dhiren has rightly answered after the Kota uh, So, uh, treatment is priority, and the police inquiry is the second thing which we have to consider. Uh, now the second question is for uh, Dr. Darbar. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Dr. Jai wanted to say something. I think. Okay, okay. sir, something. you yeah. can. Ah, sure, sure. Sorry, sir. So we at least I have observed in couple of cases with such kind of concern that we do not want to do medical legal yeah, case with the female. Uh, in future, there would be significant conflict uh, from both the sides. And at that point of time, uh, our role uh, our role is controversial, and we may be accused of helping one party unnecessarily. That is what is my. One more question. In any, uh, from case, in any suspicious case, we have to inform the police. It will be matter of their whether to go for or not. But uh, from our side, we have to keep the record that police has been informed and police has come for the. Uh, asking the anything better, sir. Sorry. One more uh, problem which we are facing uh, as a family physician. So, so many times the patient uh, who are in ICU may uh, are serious or or ventilator, and the doctor has lost the hope, and then the uh, patient uh, are ready to take the patient at home, and the they circus at the home. At that time, they call us as a family patient to certify as a cause of death. So, uh, what should be our role? Should we certify, or it is a responsibility of the hospital to certify? So, I guess if the patient is, uh, 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 the, the the hospital. Uh, let me put the example in different manner. I am at Ahmedabad and a patient is from Eder. I would not be able to certify at Eder. At that point of time, a local physician or general practitioner has to certify the death. Now, regarding cause of death, if the patient is under regular treatment and follow-up of a particular doctor and if the documents are available and if some other doctor has seen the patient and now the patient has died, he can always give the cause of death for a given scenario. Now, if the circumstances of death is too different, then only is the question. If I'm taking treatment of one disease, and if I die of something else, then only is the uh, small question uh, should come. That is what is my understanding. I guess the learned uh, doctor from who's doing medical legal uh, learning can help us Further, no, actually, the actually, common question. It is a very yes. common scenario in the emergency cases where the patient's relative is because of uh, any issue, whether the patient is just going to die or there is economical issue, they are not ready to keep the patient uh, for the longer time in the ICU. So what they say that the or in any aged patient also sometimes. So they always insist that I will we will go at the home. Now we won't keep the patient at the ICU. So in such case, usually patients are already critical. And they are going to die at the home without any uh, ventilation or any support of the life, any life support. So there will be the question again. So in that case, I would like to say that uh, a male physician can write down the time of the death when he has last seen. And okay. even he can write down the base of the particular hospitalized history. So what was the history since how many days and so what now at last has uh, uh, occurred at, the, at this moment. So he can write down. There is no issue. Okay. Now, uh, if Anish B is there, as Anish B, do you hear me? 
Hello. Yes, I am very much here. Okay, uh, sir. Uh, there are two or three questions. One question is uh, relevant to cardiology. Uh, there are few ECG machines uh, now in the market who are supporting uh, with the diagnosis also online. There is one kind of company who has come out with the ECG lead with a uh, belt, rubber belt, something, something like that. And that patient has to wear, is irrespective of the size, size of the uh, chest, chest patient size. So uh, uh, that sort of uh, belt with lead, is it proper to uh, uh, track uh, this record, the ECG? I mean, I am so not is... aware about this belt, what you say is which company is producing, whether it has been validated against the routine ECGs? Uh, I think, uh, one company has come up, I think, try to or somewhere that who has come up with a, this uh, some sort of elastic belt we, and they have uh, chased lead on it. That's and okay. It's only, I think, for the sake of making it comfortable for person who doesn't know how to put the lead. If yeah. that is the only necessity, that's fine. See, I See, somebody in rural area is unaware where is V1, V2, V3, V4, or where is 1, AVL, AVR. So he or she doesn't understand this. So instead of that, that belt has got multiple leads. And the way you wear the belt, it will create V1, V2, V3. If that is the story, it's okay. Okay. But what I want to say, is, suppose one person is a thin, other one is a uh, hefty one. The chest size will be different. So lead placement will be little bit one, two, two, three centimeter different. Does it make any difference in ECG recording? It, it, it makes micro difference, but see, there are two very important purposes of ECG. And we as cardiologists only come to only two conclusions. Number one is ST elevation myocardial infarction. Yes. And number two, arrhythmia. There is no role of ECG for any third thing. Log say ST depression, STD changes, they all can be there without any disease or with multiple disease or no disease. Yes. Like I have my ECG, I'm absolutely normal, everything on which LIC person is not giving me LIC, <laughs> that your ECG is wrong. Now, so ECG has only two value, ST elevation MI and arrhythmia. There is no third value. So even if lead is little up and down, arrhythmia is arrhythmia and ST elevation MI is ST elevation MI. Maybe say instead of ST elevation in V1, V2, V3, you will get in V3, V4, V5, V6. But you know that it is ST elevation MI. Therefore, at least for a family physician, as I talk to you, there are four or five things to be done. The rest, O2 if needed, sorbitate if BP is good, disprint, ticagrelol, statin. That's it. So yes, it can be useful. And last question. Uh, since a few, six, a few months, we are hearing young days. And even in our practice also, I think day before yesterday, I saw 30 year old male, unmarried male patient without any comorbid condition, without any family history, uh, having acute MI. See, does it relate to this COVID uh, or something else? And what is your message for it? A oh, good point. This is wonderful. I have discussed on many platforms. So when COVID was there active, active COVID disease does lead to thrombosis and hyperthrombosis, which is evident. But now there is no active COVID or neither to that extent. That was a time where people were not vaccinated. So people used to run very high inflammatory and thrombotic response of the body. So now we do not have serious COVID. So COVID itself now causing acute MI is uncommon. Number one. Number two, vaccine I always believed is of no relevance as far as MI is concerned. And now some data has also emerged where they say that vaccine does not lead to any kind of MI. Now what happens See, when you do something for a large number of people, you will always find a lot of things in large number. See, when you give vaccine to 300 crore people, you will find many events happening in thousands. Now, it, it may be just chance. So that's how even post-vaccine, if whatever we say MI is not vaccine related. Now, very serious issue, which let me break here, is we know that there are 10, 12 important risk factors of heart. One of them is to be Indian. One of them is to have stress. One of them is to have impaired lifestyle. Now, see, people do not know the meaning of healthy lifestyle. Every morning, newspaper calls me, Sir, ye insan ekdam healthy jin ki jee raha tha, wo mar gaya ke kaake. Me bula, ab health ki definition kya yaakti? Gym me ek ghanta ja ke muscle bana li, wo health nahi hai. Wo gym wala raat ko bidi pita hai, daru pita hai, drugs leta hai. That's not health. 
और कोई इंसान एक्सरसाइज भी करता है तो दिमाग में कचरा भरा है जेलसी भरी है हेटरेट भरा है एंगर भरा है ईगो अनिश चंद्रा को ईगो है कि मैं ही सबसे मान का तो फिर एक्सरसाइज का कोई मतलब नहीं सो हेल्थ इज अ वेरी कॉम्प्रीहेंसिव डेफिनेशन हार्डली रेयरली फ्यू पीपल लिव हेल्थी लाइफ सो लोग ये भूल जाते हैं सो इंडिया हैज बीन प्रिपेयरिंग टू हैव मल्टीपल यंग एम आई फॉर लास्ट ट्वेंटी ईयर्स स्मोकिंग बढ़ रहा है टोबेको बढ़ रहा है स्ट्रेस बढ़ रहा है ओबेसिटी बढ़ रही है डायबिटीज बढ़ रहा है ब्लड प्रेशर सर हर रोज हजारों यंग डेथ होगा इंडिया में दस साल में रोएगा इंडिया क्योंकि हम प्लान कर रहे हैं हार्ट अटैक लाने का हर इंसान खराब जिंदगी जी रहा है हर इंसान का टारगेट हेल्थ है ही नहीं हेल्थ यदि है तो एक दिन जाके बढ़िया हॉस्पिटल में जाके हेल्थ चेकअप करवा लिया वो फाइल डॉक्टर देसाई साहब ने देखी कि नहीं परवा नहीं देख के डॉक्टर महादेव साहब ने क्या बोला परवा नहीं फाइल आरमारी में रख दी सर पूरा हेल्थ चेकअप नॉर्मल है एवरीबडी से दिस इंडिया में सौ में से सत्तर लोगों का हेल्थ चेकअप नॉर्मल नहीं आएगा दैट इज आउ स्टेट मगर हर इंसान बोलता है सो अकॉर्डिंग टू मी स्टिल दोज ओल्ड एंशियन रिस्पेक्टर्स आर रिस्पॉन्सिबल फॉर नाइनटी ऑफ हार्ट अटैक 10% of of heart attack happens in people whom we we have not recognized as having risk, but we are learning newer risk See, one of them is lipoprotein A. If your lipoprotein A is more than 50, that single point is enough to give heart attack. So those 10% person who are not well evaluated, or sometimes there is a limitation of science, we have not still picked up certain blood tests. Say, for example, inflammation. So inflammation can lead to heart attack, but still 90% of heart attack happens. Through non-established risk factors, and what we can do is we have to control those non-risk factors to the fullest, and we can prevent huge MI. But that is unfortunate. Even if India wake wakes up today, 140 crore people, government and all NGOs become active that we want zero heart attack. We will take 30 years, 30 years. Even if we decide today. Now, last question is anti American pro BNP anti. Uh, uh, does it have any relation higher than this uh, figure uh, higher good point, the... good point. so let me give two three just simple points about bnp and anti pro bnp better to get anti pro bnp because bnp is elevated even by a drug called as arni many patients of heart failure are on arni so bnp gets falsely elevated so get only anti pro bnp number one anti pro bnp is a marker of increase stress in left ventricular wall now it can be systolic heart failure with increased stress in left ventricular wall or it can be diastolic heart failure with increased stress in ventricular wall but if anti pro bnp the normal value is roughly 125 picogram if it is more than three times that is more than 375 there is a high probability that person has got either systolic or diastolic heart failure that is second and third higher the value worse the prognosis that's also proven Thank you. Over to Dhiran. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Dr. Anish Bhai, I always tell my patient that for gym, you have only one hour. But the other 23 hours you are having for your lifestyle. So that will the you Perfect. 23 hours management will save you rather than only one hour. If I'm not Absolutely wrong. Absolutely perfect. That, that, that's, that's how it goes. Yes. Thank you, sir. Uh, sir, uh, exactly. you can do it for one day and one hour. जब भाई जिंदगी में प्रोफेशन में धंधे में जो भी करना है करो फिर मंदिर पे जाके माथा टेक लो आप खत्म एंड आई हैव सीन लॉट मेनी यंग पेशेंट हु आर डूइंग जिम एंड बेटिंग मसल्स दे गो ऑन टेकिंग टेस्टोस्टेरोन इंजेक्शन लाइक एनीथिंग यस एवरी थर्ड डे दे कम फॉर द टेस्टोस्टेरोन इंजेक्शन आई वी से दैट इट इज नॉट द राइट सर आप यू डोंट माइंड हम हमको लेना है दिस आर द पेशेंट हु आर कमिंग आई थिंक दे रॉन्ग डू डूइंग रॉन्ग थिंग्स यस ओके व्हाट ऑफ Great. Yes. Uh, on the behalf of College of General Practitioner, I would like to thank all the both the speakers who have really delivered very nicely exp explanation regarding uh, emergencies, cardiac and non-cardiac. I say I know Dr. Jogotari uh, rightly said that the non-cardiac emergency is a very, very, very big subject, and it is very difficult to uh, complete or uh, consult in uh, only 20 to 30 minutes. Again, I am uh, here nicely. Uh, most of the covered uh, most of the topics and the most of the emergencies. Again, I'm also thankful to Dr. Madhavi Desai who has remained with us for, for all the time. I'm also thankful to our uh, Pragnesh Bhai Shah who has coordinated the whole session. And again, I'm thankful to all the speakers and the doctors who have united with us. Our next program will be on the next month on the 19th of October. And uh, most probably the subject will be uh, menopause and andropause or geriatric like 
uh, disease regarding male and female. So thank you so much once again. Thanks a lot to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you sir. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank Very you. Very nice session. Uh, thank you, Anish Bhai, and thank you, Dr. Jai Bhai and Madhavi. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.